keep going. I said I'd break off last time at uh, a suitable point, and as uh, Stuart remembers, it was in the 1920s. But what I'm actually going to do now is fast forward to the present and then look back over the last 60 years, because to be candid, in terms of loco development and activity, not a lot shifted. Once they'd established running up and down with the new engines, River Esque and River Earth in particular. <clears throat> but just to, this, this whole idea was to, to, to discuss how the, we got to how we operate the railway today and how the engines work and comparative, uh, how they work compared to what used to happen. And uh, just to um, uh, refresh what you all know in a way, because you've all been active, I'm sure, in either on the railway in the present, the past or the recent times. Um, you'll have ridden on the engines, I'm sure. And one of the great entertainments of actually working on the locos is that you're doing it all, usually, unless you've got a... Uh, uh, an assistant with you, but you're the driver and the fireman, and you don't have this interesting situation with the big railway trains where there is a separate driver fireman and they sometimes don't get on with each other. Um, you're doing it all, you're thinking it all. The thing has changed though in 60 odd years quite dramatically in places because we've got a situation now where the trains are continuous brakes. Um, <clears throat> the fuel's changed over the last few years to a coal, it used to be coke. And uh, the whole operation of the locomotive is actually markedly different. As I say, you're the driver and the stoker, you're doing all the thinking and doing it uh, on the locomotive, sometimes you could actually do with an extra set of hands stuck somewhere to work the sanders when the engine's not gripping the rails and you've got to operate the regulator and the sand and do the other things that the fireman would have done, put water in the boiler or whatever is required at the given time. <clears throat> and the other fascinating thing about our particular line, I referred to it last time, was that uh, the terrain is, is, is really remarkably um, undulating, for want of a better word. What was it they complained about? Whether they wanted 114 changes of level gradient board uh, to satisfy the railway inspectors back in 1875. And although the gradients have been moderated in places and the humps, uh, the hollows, should I say, taken out, the humps are usually there because Mother Estelle's just underneath the surface. But here we've got River Earth just coming over Walk Mill Summit in the map ground. It's gone up one in 50. It's just in the trees where the track is highlighted, come down at one in 50. It's gone through a little hollow and by the big stone, it's now starting to climb at one in 80. And you've got to keep the train just rolling nicely to not be galloping or catch everything up on the downhill and then pull it out again to start climbing. If the engine was to slow right down at this particular point, or even stop perhaps for permanent way workers or, or, or some such, uh, you would then realize what a gradient the train is actually on at this point. Ever-changing gradients, it's, it's probably the most interesting and possibly difficult line in that sense compared to any other um, uh, a preserved railway. And I'm not denigrating any of them because they're all fascinating in their different ways. And as I said about the Romney Arden Dimchurch Railway last week, you know, it may be level, but it's all uphill for a loco from when you set off. Um, we've got gradients like this, the steepest gradient on the line, Hollin Howe Bank, setting off from a standing start from Estel Green or the Green Station under the bridge in the background, straight up onto the hill, but dead straight, no trees overhanging, no serious problems at any time. Coming down, it might be a different matter. And down that one in 40 odd gradient, 
the train needs to be kept under control. And if it isn't, you would know about it. And for all the times that <coughs> I've been involved, I was aware that we had a breakaway back in 1968 where the rear of the train uncoupled from the front. Uh, it wasn't noticed straight away. And the rear end followed the front couple of coaches and the engine down this bank at a fair old rate. Now, let's get back to 60 odd years ago. These are the gentlemen who just come out of the auction in Gosforth in September 1960. Um, they were well pleased with themselves because in a few weeks they've managed to rally a considerable amount of support and got everybody in the same alignment. There was no fighting, no bidding against everything. It was try and get this little railway running again and make a proper job of it. Um, the engine river urch there, it's um, a markedly different river urch in the control systems to what it is today. Um, in fact, somebody I believe was asking how they slowed the engines on the trains down without uh, continuous brakes on the train operating over the gradients that I've just described. And the engines were put into reverse, not necessarily put with steam behind the reversing valve here, but simply put into reverse. Uh, the pistons would blow backwards and forwards. The valves will be in the opposite phase to what they normally are to drive the engine and there'd be resistance. In fact, it would try to pump air into the boiler. And it was a remarkably subtle way of handling the train. Uh, when I started and Trevor started, we used to do that. That was how it was done. It was how it was taught. And I'll pass on that teaching to people I'm involved with because it's a distinct art of its own. And it's a very useful thing for somebody to be able to know how to do it, not necessarily do it habitually, but to know how to do it because you've got a train behind you pushing and it's to some degree got loose links in it, something like six inches of slack from one end of our trains to the other through the coupling pins and to handle that gently without snatching, that takes a bit of art over the changing gradients that we've got. So River Earth there in its original uh, 1920s form um, the interesting things are it's only got one gauge glass and in the far side a lubricator, hydrostatic lubricator pumping oil through with steam pressure. Um, this was the principal problem possibly we didn't appreciate at the time with the actual locomotive side of braking with the engine in reverse. You create such temperatures inside the cylinders that <coughs> the oil film dissipates, burns off effectively, and the wear and tear on the piston rings was quite considerable. In, in those days, we used to get a couple of years of good running, and then you'd have a year of blowing pistons, and you've managed to possibly after that get some new piston rings put on the loco. Nowadays, operated in a different regime, uh, coasting down the hill, perhaps in mid-gear, to keep the oil in the system, those piston rings just go on and on and on, and the engines are kept in a much better condition throughout. So there we have River Earth trying to uh, stabilise a train. The old teaks are there. They're coupled together with uh, original Haywood couplings like the wagons used to have. They've got a big link inside them. They were permanently coupled together, and uh, you knew you had to handle them gently, uh, or somebody at the back will get quite a shock if you ricocheted the train apart. <clears throat> um, a full train of nine carriages with 160 odd people, and it was quite a thing to handle. And uh, you were aware of, there were things you were taught, like pull them round the sharper corners like Fisher Ground and Spout House. You didn't let the train buckle up behind you and then pull it out. You just tried to make the whole thing flow down the line. And this was done, again, with something that was different in those days. The 
coaches had oil bearings, oil plane bearings fed my oil. And um, <clears throat> on Monday morning, they were all oiled. Every carriage on the railway was oiled. On Monday afternoon, the oil dripped out on the railway. Monday afternoon, Tuesday, Wednesday, the oily railway track could be very, very greasy if it rained. And that was one of the things that, um, should we say, uh, uh, something that people nowadays would hardly conceive of. The two locos of the time, River Esk on the left and River Earth, they're there in the shed, the raising steam. It looks not dissimilar to what we use today. There's a vacuum cleaner motor stuck behind the doors, pumping air through those tubes up the little chimneys that you can see at the top of the picture. Uh, what you can't see, breathe, smell and take in is that the smoke comes out of the tubes just above the sight line, drops down into the shed and uh, the whole place is a fog. Uh, I mean, it was such a fog that the drivers didn't live very long. Everybody smoked in those days, of course, but this was like smoking capstan, extra strength, double what's it, every inch of them, every, every morning of your life. <clears throat> now, shortly after the society took over and everything, I say the society, I mean the preservation movement, the society and the new company that was formed, um, there were minor crises. Uh, and the ones that particularly affected the locos were to do with the boilers, water was one particular thing. The water in originally was driven by the Fisher Ground water tank that we still have on our emergency supply. But as well as that, at the Ravenglass end, initially it was fed from a Moncaster private supply. And the combination of the two water supplies seemed to moderate decay on the boilers. Let's leave it at that. They weren't too badly off. But then Moncaster had to alter its water supplies. The railway was forced to take mains water initially from a temporary supply at Muckester Mill. And then later on, the mains water was taken into the village so that uh, virtually all the village eventually was put directly onto the mains water coming out of the lakes, Ennerdale, untreated at that time in any shape or form. And one way and another, the attrition, the decay on the boilers was quite dramatic. Um, if you read in the newsletters, you'll get some idea that boilers have been away, retubing, new fireboxes, severe rebuilds. And over those first few years, <clears throat> they seem to be a consequence of that change in water supply. And so there was that, we need a new engine, we need another engine. And so we got the River Might as we know it today, built on the coupled wheels that had run under the tender of the River Esk, and as we referred to before, the original wheels of the River Esk engine itself. The original new locomotive project was actually to be more or less the same as the River Esk. It used the tender, sorry, use the Pulteney tender chassis with minor alterations for visual looks. This was a first impression that somebody come up with, six wheel tender, smoke deflectors, and uh, one or two things just to make it visually different to the engine that was built. <clears throat> and there were thoughts about the engine from other people. Colin Gilbert, the person in the center of the picture on the footplate here, um, he was the managing director of the great uh, finance behind the new organization, didn't think the society were actually going to ever raise enough money. And even if they did, he didn't think a 282 loco was actually a good idea. He thought a 460 would have been much better. Um, however, uh, the project took off, the engine got sent, sorry, the, the chassis got sent to York, the project started to gather momentum. It had a boiler donated by the gentleman cutting the ribbon, Mr. Satow, the then chairman of the society. And Mr. Gilbert's contribution to the whole thing was to 
fund putting a cutting through to cut off the sharpest bends, so the wear and tear on the engines will be dramatically reduced. Now, there was new rail put through the cutting at that time, new track, on the significant lengths of new track started at that point. Um, but for the rest of the railway, it was operating in a mixture. Some of it was three foot gauge, regauged. Some of it was uh, First World War track uh, renewed in the 1920s. Um, but all in all, with the condition of the sleepers, the gauge was extremely doubtful. And the one evident thing that showed this up was the visit of the first Bassett Lauk Atlantic Little Giant back in 1965, the engine's own half century, when basically it was disappointing that the track wasn't good enough for the engine to do much more than leave the station at Ravenglass. And that was the change in 20 years. Um, and the railway operated in a peculiar way. Uh, if there was uh, a situation where too many people turned up for one train, they simply sent another one out afterwards with the passenger tractor, the engine that's now the Perkins usually, or a, a tiny diesel that had been acquired, pulling the second portion. And they were run on a time interval basis. Ideally, the second one should have been 10 minutes behind the first one. Not everybody had watches in those days. And the suggestion of the railway's inspectorate was to um, have these clocks along the line side, Fisher Ground, Murthway, Burton Road in particular. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, in practice, they weren't used for very long because the problem practically was that while a train had stopped at this for the driver to sign in his time, another one might be closing in on it behind. So they were effectively abandoned certainly by the mid 1960s when the railway's traffic was increasing and as traffic does it busy days are nice days uh, that concentrates itself so that you suddenly you might have day after day week after week of damp dire weather but when it's nice everybody comes and so these were the scenes of august 1967 when they tried running not just a doubled up train in one direction, but two portion trains going in opposite directions, four trains trying to get past each other at Erton Road on a much shorter loop line than exists at the present. Uh, the first portion to arrive was Royal Anchor on the left hand side, shot into the siding as it then was, and its steam engine came in behind River Ert running up, aiming. Uh, the points have been set uh, <clears throat> legally for the little shed so that there was no chance of it running into the trains on the extreme right hand side uh, where the steam trains are the first portion. You can't see the engine on that one. And the passenger tractor, the old mock steam engine outlined Fordson engine coming in with the second portion of the down train behind it. Note that the uh, guard on the up train with the River Ert, uh, David Bell there, is actually travelling on the locomotive. Um, <clears throat> but things were to change the following year because the loop at Ert Road was extended, two trains could pass in each direction, and the whole gamut of timekeeping on the railway changed quite dramatically. There were regular services uh, which operated more or less every hour and they could be doubled up with extra portions as required possibly even three portions going in uh, <coughs> one direction and two going in another uh, i'm not quite sure why uh, the diesel sorry i say the diesel the ic engine the passenger tractors in the loop in the middle of the picture waiting to go out and the quarrymen's coming in uh, <coughs> on the uh, second portion of the up train. But by this stage, the guards were now traveling at the rear of the train with a handbrake. And I think that's Neil Glover standing by the rear of the train in the siding there. 
The River Might had arrived with a great flourish of publicity, wonderful publicity taken across the Northern Bells by the Stafford brothers with their engine providence has been recreated a couple of years ago. And the engine was, well, it sat in the shed. There were all sorts of things that weren't quite right. Um, a list that's almost beyond recall. And um, the glum looks on people's faces here, but the reality of, um, are we going to get it ready for an opening in the middle of the summer or not? As it happened, when it did run, it was possibly its first ever successful run up the line with passengers, and it's to its credit that it managed something like 13 coaches, heavily loaded, without any fuss or bother. Um, I think the worst moment was the uh, young man whose ears have stuck out the back of his head looking forward to Graham Withers, because Graham had asked him to change the points over when I've gone back to the station. He'd come out of the engine shed, up the engine shed head shunt, and was expecting to drop into the station and my brother to change the points for him for the next train to go back to the water tank and coal stage. So we uh, changed the points a little too early. And the look on Graham's face when he thought he'd derailed about 25 minutes before the big ceremony can only be imagined. <clears throat> anyway, the mic was a great publicity success and a, a bit of a struggle for its first couple of years. It wasn't helped by the fact, as I've said before, that the trains were working with oil bearings and they were oiled every Monday and every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, it was very greasy. Um, so there were sights for sore eyes whenever there was a little shower. I can remember a guy pick up seen on the front of the engine. He wasn't slim, there wasn't a lot of room, but he was there laying sand for the engine to go along. But there were things about to change. Um, one interesting and possibly less recorded thing was the gentleman who'd owned this engine. It's a seven and a quarter engine, obviously nothing like a size of our machines, but the idea that he brought out was if you had a narrow gauge engine on a given size of track, it would be bigger and beefier, bigger boiler, whatever, than one that was purporting to be a model of a standard gauge. This is his Rio Grande seven and a quarter, a gentleman called Brian Hollingsworth, and he came up with a scenario that the railway ought to be thinking of more engines and you could have a family of them. Um, what you needed was a standard boiler. It's a really good boiler on that river esque. Um, but if you had a sort of narrow gauge uh, line, you could make all the bits that go round and wear out underneath much, much more robust. Roller bearings throughout. This is from his project document. And um, he had all sorts of, there was a, a Rio Grande looking outline. Obviously, he had that. And the other was a River Amazon, not named after Arthur Ransom's River Amazon, but the, the idea of copying one of those South American British built locos. And um, <clears throat> this in the summer 1967 was quite, oh, this was quite evolutionary. It led to some volunteers sitting in the camping coach one night, having had a few drinks and coming up with the idea well there's an engine out there that could be altered it's got a narrow gauge outline already just looks a bit odd and this of course was River Earth with its old 1920s image where they designed it to match the River-esque in side outline but not in the three-dimensional form because of its wide prototype beginnings with Muriel, the Arthur Haywood Muriel, considerably wider, shown up here when the might and the earth were coming down double-headed for some not quite explained reason. I think there might have been an engine doing something that it shouldn't have dealt out. But it took a while and eventually that idea took shape in the alterations done to River Earth in 1972. Um, it's all a cab, running there with its original tender, new boiler fittings and the tall chimney. That's River Mike, the original River Mike's chimney, 
extended with a piece of pipe. Um, it looked different. It kept the driver protected to a considerable degree, but it also steamed distinctly better because of the drafting up the taller chimney. I mean, that wasn't intended, but the intention was to actually try and capture some of the impression of <coughs> a narrow gauge engine that might have been appropriate to the size of our new coaches that were being built. And the other justification was that a new engine of our own was again being considered. It was in the design stages at that stage to be something like a 464 tank engine, 462 tank engine, uh, but using river earth cylinders and valve gear arrangements, but outside frames and a river S boiler on top. Or would it have a river S boiler? That was the uh, real thing that we weren't sure of at the time. The Romney Island Dimchurch Railway had introduced superheating on its, and I'll explain a bit about that in a minute, uh, on its new boilers fitted from the 1950s. It had taken the idea, um, given the prospect of the savings that could be involved to the Festiniog Railway. And so the opportunity arose to borrow the Northern Chief Loco from the Romney Island in Church and operate it here briefly in the end of 1971. Everybody had a go on the locomotive with the drivers and here's Graham with us having a trip up the line with Terry Waywell, the locos representative driver from the Romney Hive. And the object was to see what the benefit of superheating might be. These bundles of pipe, the several there, would go inside the boiler of a superheated loco. These are from the Romney Hyde Railway. And they go down big tubes inside the boiler. The steam that's emitted from the regulator goes into these. And by the time it comes out the end, it's been dried out so that any moisture in it has turned into fresh steam. And the end result is you do have great economy of operation. You do have certain practical problems. One of them is lubrication and the other is handling a locomotive uh, when the regulator has all this extra steam pipe uh, after it. So if you've got the engine slipping and the engine driver controls the slipping by the regulator, the steam that's in these superheaters has to go through the cylinders and make the slipping perpetuate or even worse. So in practice, it wasn't adopted at this time, although we did have a look at it later. The thing that was adopted was the actual detail of the regulator systems on the uh, uh, Romney Hutton in church engines. And um, they were put onto River Might as a prior thing to involving that development on the new locomotive then being built called at that point Sir Arthur Hayward. One of the useful things uh, that the river might was to do, by now it had settled down, it had had several intermediate workshop days in the uh, works at Ravenglass and many of its problems were gradually being sorted out. And the society funded the next development for the railway, one that's absolutely fundamental, possibly the greatest thing that's been done in an operational sense for the locos. And that was the introduction of continuous braking on the trains. The society funded a steam air compressor to go on the river might. It, it didn't work as well as it should have, um, but at this point, that wasn't the particular problem. But the gentleman on the foot plate there, with his fingers in, some thumb in the air, a Hugh Taylor, as a, a gunnery engineer, who visited the various establishments of Kukubri and down here at S. Meals as a volunteer, helped the engines, guys to steam the engines in the morning and uh, had a legendary uh, capacity to make suet puddings. But his, his endeavours to sort out the project air brake system uh, was 
fundamental. Um, basically, he worked out a system, oh, there's a young man driving the engine. Um, he worked out a system, and it's the proportions of things that people couldn't quite get their head around. How much brake force you needed on the wheels so that it would slow a train down, but not make the wheels slide and pick up. When the changing weight on the vehicles could be anything from a lot, an empty weight, a tear weight of one and a half tons, and a ton and a half of passengers in it. So basically, the weight doubling, how do you get the right proportion of brake to achieve a useful brake force without sliding the wheels? Um, can you use easily available equipment? Yes, you could have bought mine equipment and it would cost a small fortune. However, he managed to do it with commercial vehicle parts. These were air brake cylinders off small vehicles, buses and small lorries and things like that. And getting the proportions of the valves that made it actuate so that we actually had all these commercial vehicle parts operating in a fail safe, what we would call the single pipe wave Westinghouse automatic system. So that if the pipe that joins the carriages together breaks, then all the bits of the train stop without anybody doing anything automatically. And that was Hugh's great thing. Funnily enough, it didn't actually have an impact on the uh, steam loco operation for several years because of trying to get a steam loco compressor to be fundamentally reliable. But for the diesels, it certainly eased their life dramatically. The little engine in front there, the Royal Anchor, had no brakes for many years. It used to have a charmed life, and certainly if it burst one of its drive hoses, it was then completely uncontrollable until it stopped wherever it stopped. Having laid an oil slick down the railway with the 50 gallons of hydraulic oil that it carried. The Sheila in the background, the Sheila there in its blue livery. Uh, <coughs> the Sheila was um, uh, always giving drive problems, but it was braking through the same system as it used to drive the engine forward. And the pressure gauges on it showed that trying to slow trains down on the gradients and stop them exerted more effort into the system, far more effort into the system than you could trying to pull that same train. So train braking made things much more reliable. Um, meanwhile, the same engines were operating on the old system. In fact, you can see here George Staniforth handling the reverser to park his engine river out right on the mark. You can see the white mark at the bottom of the picture on the turntable. Now, our engines just fit on our turntables and the drivers know where to put that white mark to best advantage because although they just fit on the turntable, the imbalance in weight, even moving an inch or so either way, makes a terrific difference to getting the turntable balanced so that a small boy can push it down. Um, and as I say, there's George handling the reverser just to park it in, in exactly the right spot, the same system in a way that would have been used to handle the train. Meanwhile, coming down to our new engine, which we'll look at for a moment or two, work continued in the summertime in the workshops year by year from 1972 through to its final completion in 1976. Um, <clears throat> here, the driving wheels are being pressed on by Ian Page. And there, the driving wheel sets are being made ready to go into the main frames in the old workshop as it was. Uh, the engine went in a fairly unfinished state to a gathering of great renown at the Stockton and Darlington, uh, whatever centenary and a bit it was in 1875, 1975, 150th, yes, um, to show them. And it was on display, the newest locomotive being built in the country at the time. I think the one prior to that was the replica locomotion that was going to run at the head of the processions. Um, in due course, fairly rapid due course, through that winter, the engine was finished and ran, of course, on its opening launch day on the 
uh, what was to be the Dean of the Railway in 1976. Everybody who was involved from the designer and the builder to the local parish council dressed up appropriately. And it was uh, a grand day out. It's equally remarkable that the engine worked literally out of the box and 40 years on and a bit now it's still working um, very little change one or two details like the actual suspension links on the springs and the actual air brake equipment bolted to the side of the boiler um, in fact it's worked so well that obviously I'm talking to the converted, but two engines went to Japan and you'd be hard pressed to see the difference. It's a good old spotting technique, you know, curved steam pipe covers versus the straight ones. The Northern Rock 2, even though it's got number one on its buffer beam, and the lining and everything pretty well matching. I think there was something like um, a quarter of a mile of lining on the engine. I know that because I had to do it um, against the deadline. Let's leave it like that. When the engine was being christened, the front buffer beam was only just newly painted at three o'clock the previous morning. Uh, and its fellow Cumbria, which was a um, identical machine underneath different clothing. Uh, and just Following the Brian Hollingsworth idea, you know, you, you've got a standardised machine, but on top of it, you can make it look like any pretty engine you want. Change the colour, the shape of the dome, the windows, you've got a completely different looking machine. And they've operated in Japan now since 1989 uh, and um, 92. And um, the only thing that's been altered on them is the uh, improvised rain shelter fairly torrential in Japan when it does rain. There were other things to entertain us at the time. We had a visit from an engine that's literally just passed through coming back to us, a two foot gauge gasworks engine that had been given to the railway because the owner wanted it to have a safe and secure existence. Um, and the other entertainment and equal entertaining four couples loco was this machine which was Count Louis. We loaned it from the Fairbourne Railway because it was uh, exactly the uh, compatriot of the Bassett Lauk Class 30 engine that had opened our line in 1915. Count, uh, sorry, Sans Farrell. It was in an exhibition, the Ratty 100 exhibition, which was in the building that's now the main workshop and the precursor to our museum enterprises. Uh, it was a while before we managed to persuade one of the Fairborn volunteers that had been loaned from the Fairborn Railway to come and steam it up. And it was an eye opener because prior to that, nobody really realized what these little machines were capable of. There was a, a, a sort of a stigma about them, I can only be described as, that they fell apart, they weren't very capable. The fact that they kept the railway operating for nearly a decade, in 1915 to the 20s, um, that's uh, historians by the by. <clears throat> but when, at the end of that season, we had a, um, a gathering of little engines, um, it and its other fairborn compatriot, Sean, the one that's just at the right hand side of the picture there, were again the eye openers. We, we knew the Romney Hyde and Dimchurch, um, Dr. Sin in the middle was, it was a Romney engine, built like, shines like, goes like. Um, the Krupp uh, Rose and Cavalier in the middle we had some moments with, but it was a big, robust machine. And certainly, if the railway could have acquired one at that time, uh, money would have changed hands. Meanwhile, Sean did a remarkable set of operations. Every day we put more coaches on behind it until it was running with six or seven carriages without effort. And it actually led to the concept that Dundee, the Bonnie Dundee tank engine, would no longer be thought of as a, um, 
uh, what was it going to be? It was going to have a single carriage and inspection saloon. It was going to come out for private buying. And in practice, the thought was, well, maybe there is an opening for a small engine uh, that could run light trains in the off-season. <clears throat> and so, eventually, it took shape as the Bonnie Dundee tank engine that we know. And later on, it would run round with its own particular set of carriages, the maxi carriages that came from the Gateshead Garden Festival Railway. And the interesting thing was that those coaches could load every single seat because of their particular layout. They've got a, a sort of corridor effect with seats down either side of the central and you could fit 30 people in them. They would just sit in without effort. You can't get that number, sorry, you can't get a full number of people in what we nominally think of as 20 seat coaches um, because people don't want to sit that close together. They like their little compartments. So Dundee with its six maxes would actually pull round the same number of people as one of our bigger locos with nine or ten coaches behind it. And the other delight of the times was um, this four-coupled engine, which um, somebody travelled on the engine with me in 1977, the end of August. And uh, he said, oh, I'm going to Manchester. He was an American. He was a collector of little engines. Uh, they're, they're selling the zoo. I'm going to see the engines there, but I don't think I'll buy one because I like ten and a quarter. The 15 inch. Luckily, the following day was my day off, and um, Kate and I went to the Bellevue Zoo and we talked our way into the workshops where this machine was sat out of use with some minor troubles. And they were, yeah, they were going to close the railway and the whole operation down in a matter of weeks. Uh, and it, it wasn't me that got it out of uh, Sir Charles Forte. That was a uh, an old boy's trick that Lord Wakefield pulled. But um, the Science Museum offered us a funding to buy it as if we had needed it. And of course, it was intended for our museum. It would be a static exhibit at that time to go in a gallery alongside the old museum. But the great thing was that once we got it, it became a project. This engine has to steam again. And this is its first steaming with its Sellafield apprentices who'd helped do the job and in getting involved and stuck in. And I won't dwell on St. Alder except to say it works its little heart out. And with the improvements of the track that had been taken place over the few years since Little Giant made its first moves that wouldn't get it out of the line, and 10 years later in 1976 didn't get any further than it had previously. But by 1981, Little Giant was able to go the full distance around the railway and made several visits. And its wheels in those days were the same wheels that had come off the rails in the 1960s. So it's a credit to the people who'd renewed our track. Here it is with uh, King George, the class 20, from even originally from Southport and are soon older behind. So Bassett Labs 10, 20, and 30 running in harmony. And Sonolda had run uh, here and there, little flagship engine. Here it was at the National Railway Museum at York, where uh, we were operating on what then was a, a siding of the Kirklees Light Railway, operated by Stuart. Um, in his former capacity, alongside other engines at the great gathering at the National Railway Museum. The other, St. Alder was celebrating its centenary. We had a wonderful trip out to the school that was literally behind the engine sheds where it had run at Sand Hutton. Um, but here it stood next to that great Flying Scotsman machine, which then still had several years of trial and tribulation before it started to hit the main line. Now, Flying Scotsman links into us because in the 1980s, it made several years of visits uh, in part of the steam trains that would run here, uh, <coughs> the Cumbrian Coast Expresses, when steam wasn't such a widespread feature around the nation. There were 
dedicated steep routes and we because we were at the end of a, a decent route from Carnforth where there was a steam depot and we had the facilities at Sellafield and earlier than that at Eskmeals to turn the engines round and service them. It became a very useful operational route. From the railway point of view, these extra trains arrived on our busiest days, in the busiest time of the busiest day. And we really needed to be up and organised to handle that extra traffic. Um, the extra loops that have been put in at Fisher Ground and Mike side enabled a 20 minute service to be operated. And the 20 minute service could run for several hours and it had to run on time and be pretty well be operationally robust because the people traveling on these trains had to go back and get back to wherever, London, Liverpool, Bristol, all over the country. And remarkably, um, we had interesting incidents. We had crises, but they all rolled, sorry, they all rolled in to Ravenglass on time and got them away. Um, <clears throat> and of course, it was due to that other piece of operational interest that we evolved here, the radio signalling system, as it's been developed from the what have been operated on the Zillertalbahn in Austria. Here's Graham with us uh, speaking. So the old desk, um, we won't describe what's going on, but there was a, uh, things going on behind the scenes which nearly floored us. In fact, they were so close to flooring us, it, it really should be recognised. Behind the boarding on the fence there was our fuel supply. It was a peculiar fuel in those days, coke. And it was um, something you'd think, oh, coke is a smokeless fuel. It's the same as you put in your agar at home. Well, this stuff wasn't. It was a byproduct from a chemical plant. And it varied according to what they'd done with it. They get coal from hither and thither, from different pits, and crack it to get off whatever volatiles they were trying to get from their chemistry sets. Uh, and we got the residue. And some days the load that arrived will be uh, more receptive to combustion, should I say, than others. Sometimes you have to get it really red hot before you left or you'd have no steam up the journey. And if you got the wrong sort too hot before you set off, the engine would literally be uncontrollable, blow its head off until you got to Burton Road. And then it would go basically out. And it was capable of making clinker that nobody could believe. Paving slabs could be uh, the best description. So that in the old regime of having an hour between the train, the engine went up, the engine shed, the fireman would be cooled down with a plate on the chimney. The driver could prise out the clinkers and make up a new fire and get ready. When you were doing quick turnarounds, it was a different ball game altogether. <clears throat> and the other effect was inside the boilers. And what had happened in the middle of August, 1980, was a fresh batch of coke affected all the boilers instantly literally two days after we started burning the coke, the tubes started leaking, the seams started leaking, stays started leaking, something, it was effectively extra sulfur in the coke was cleaning out the bits of the boiler that kept them sealed and steam tight. So we had a severe crisis. Boilers were being lifted in the engine shed in August and being retuned. They'd run out of tubes. The engine, River Esk, in desperation, was sent out with some coal that our engineer friends had acquired at Traction Engine Rallies. My Gideon, what a day. It was lovely. It steamed beautifully, quietly, responsively, and we were the only steam engine for half the day, so we just went round and round in circles, without effort, without any problems. Quick turnarounds at either end, needle on the line, it was a dramatic, and as soon as that coal could be 
got from some other sources, we've stuck with coal of various sorts ever since. Um, one of the engines that could work well on the coal was this visitor, the uh, Black Prince, uh, the crop engine that the Romney had acquired and sent to us uh, in exchange for running uh, our Sheila on their school trains. And behind we've got Bonnie Dundee uh, actually producing a little bit of smoke uh, because some of the varieties of coal that we were getting weren't quite as conducive to smokeless operation as others. <clears throat> and the other problem with it was you've got these wonderful lumps of Welsh steam coal. You also had an awful lot of slack that came with it. And finally, the effect on the boilers, not so much from the coal this time, but from the water. Uh, we been treating the water, but in an uncontrolled, relatively an uncontrolled fashion. And the end result was that a boiler that was on River Esk, the same age as boilers that are still operating on the Romney Heights and Dimchurch Railway, gave serious problems in the early 1980s. Uh, the bits that hold the firebox inner and outer from exploding are the stays. You can see the red ends painted up inside that they're not usually like that um, but there are studs between the inner and outer sections of the firebox and the holes that were drilled for these to go to developed cracks and when the cracks joined up there were leaks and the leaks could be quite severe and it turned out by 1972 that river esh boiler was riddled with these cracks the caustic embrittlement it's called from basically having uncontrolled to alkaline water from putting in water treatment, but without monitoring what was going on. So the ASC was due a new boiler. It got a new boiler. And what a fascinating operational thing it was. Not necessarily because it burned coal and made steam, but because of what it was capable of doing. It was altered in the planning to work on a gas producer system. We won't go too far into this, but basically the aim was to try and burn any sort of coal uh, without making smoke to upset our passengers, either going uphill or coming back down. And various piped blowers and things were fitted to induce airflow into the fire. And the other device that really did work was diverting a little bit of steam from the air pump down under the fire into the ash pan. It broke up into hydrogen and oxygen. Um, both those things made the fire extremely lively. The end result was it could burn all sorts of fuel. And we were associated with the Castinio Railway who were doing experiments at the time with their Linda engine. They came to us and uh, we went to them and played. And um, all in all, we had some interesting results. The whole project was stimulated by a gentleman here, a Dr. John Sharp. They eventually became a professor. He was a gentleman who got some innovatory ideas. And in those days, coal burning was actually projected to be a, an interesting operation. You have plenty of coal around. The Chinese were still digging it out and run a railway system um, with old fashioned technology steam engines. Um, Dr. Sharp thought that was openings for burning coal in a different way. We were copying what happened in South America on the Rio Turbio line, which uh, I won't prolong here, but this was a two foot six gauge railway bringing coal right across the pampas uh, with small, relatively small engines. I mean, it looks big, but it's actually a fairly dainty two foot six gauge engine pulling 2000 tons of coal. And the same technology for burning, breaking up smoky coal with oxygen and hydrogen was introduced to the coal board in the 1960s with several of the engines that we would call austerity engines. Uh, and for those of us who are old enough, there was a revival of steam with experiments in South Africa um, you can see the difference between the experimental engine here producing a great haze up the chimney and the unconverted engine behind burning ordinary coal in the ordinary way, making a lot of smoke. And you may possibly have remembered an engine called 
nicknamed anyway, the Red Devil, which was quite uh, an advanced machine, altered in devious ways, but able to achieve all sorts of remarkable results in terms of economy and power output on a traditional loco frame. Well, we managed to get the same technical results out of the Riveresque as the Red Devil, because with several trials made by outside experts, fitting thermocouples and gas analysis to the machines, we were able to burn all sorts of things. We got some Laosan sewage sludge at one point, and here we're burning uh, wood chips. And um, to see the engine climb from night side up to Walk Mill Summit with a needle on the line, burning this stuff and producing very little ash out of the chimney and an incandescent white flame, really quite remarkable. Not very practical from an operational point of view, but the facility to know you could do it was proved by these. This was a Swiss gentleman um, and we won a prize, but that's by the by. Now, the other things that were interesting at the time were um, this superheating business. Could we gain anything by it? The original engines at Ravenglass had smoke box superheaters. They fill the hot bit of the front of the engine with tubes and it dried the steam off to some degree. The Romney engines I referred to earlier had extra flues down the boiler, four big flues, and the pipework we saw in an earlier picture stuck down there to take the steam into these tubes, heat it up, and then take it down to the cylinders. And, well, did it work? Well, there's a moment when you might think it's possible to change a boiler, and that's when it comes to a rebuild time, when you might want to alter it to have a new firebox. And River Mike was coming towards that point in the late 80s. So at that time, it was fortuitous. The Romney Highs sent to a gala at their engine, Hercules, with its eight coupled wheels, nearly the same size as our local wheels. Uh, this is a later picture, but we were able to test it and monitor what it did. And for a few days, we were able to use it ourselves. And we've had a dipstick in the firebox with, sorry, in the water container of the tender. We're measuring bucketfuls of coal into the coal space on the tender. And we were comparing it to the existing locomotives. And the results were, well, what they should be, superheating works. And on a line like ours with steep gradients, the superheating worked very, very, very effectively. Um, it wasn't the complete answer though, because um, although it works uh, and it saves uh, <clears throat> something like 30 odd percent of the water that you use and the fuel, um, there were other aspects to it. A Romney engine is a fascinating machine to drive when you're used to a Ravengross engine, because a very similar regulator the thing at the top of the picture actually works 180 degrees the opposite way about uh, so that you know open shut and shut is open and you can know this but you can get it wrong as well and they've got a wheel and a screw to alter the reversing system that's the wheel on the extreme right hand side of the picture and you can graduate exactly how you want the you don't have fixed notches um, between positions for the reverser, you can actually turn the wheel and, and alter the position of the reversing equipment um, so that the engine performs, for want of a better word, as precisely as you can make it. Really is a delight to handle. With the proviso that when they've got no sanding gear uh, on a greasy rail, they're a different bottle of fish, a uh, kettle of fish, should we say. But save water, they could, and, but it wasn't the only answer because we were also able to establish that our brake equipment used water through the steam. And lighting the engine in the morning, every single morning as we did, also used a proportion of fuel. So the actual savings that you might make through superheating were moderated. And overall, I think we made the best decision to have an easily operational engine when we couple our engines to the train every hour 
and we turn them round on a turntable that's not very long every hour. And to be able to do that with the ease of handling uh, ordinary machines is probably more important. But the other aspect, making the brake equipment more effective, was, was useful. I won't drag on too long now, but the great thing here was that we've been thinking about it for years. The Shan engine had a brake compressor worked by a belt under the tender. And it was when the Bure Valley engines, the new ZB class, came on the scene with a cupboard in the back of their tender with brake equipment inside it, driven by a belt, that our engineers devised one that could be fitted to the bogies of the tender and just fitted underneath our ordinary tenders. This is the one made for Willem Beck. The first one got put on River Esk and the effect was absolutely amazing. It saved steam and water uh, and it also saved maintenance because we'd had ongoing problems with maintaining air brake equipment with the steam compressors having to work for six hours a day. With the tender compressor, they were only able to, sorry, only required to work for something like six minutes a day. And the maintenance on them just plummeted dramatically. And it was the equivalent of having another man on the staff to do extra things. In fact, we'd had such problems that the brake compressors had been modified several times on our own engines. And the ones that went to Japan actually had a modified version, the sort that we now have on River Esk and Willembeck. Now, just to bring things round a bit, what else might be interesting about our engines? They burnt coal, coal's going out of fashion. Can we burn something else, oil? And we've had visitors that have shown off how it can be done. This was the Redwood Valley engine fern, which came from America with its oil equipment set up for whatever they burn out there. It wasn't quite the same as burning central heating oil supplied in Britain. So we used to get little paraffin parasols, perhaps, of unburnt paraffin descending on the train. It's not so bad going uphill, but coming down, it's a different matter. At different points, uh, when it came here, I, I either drove so that their people could fire, if they liked doing that, or fired so that they could drive. The person behind the engine cab there is a, a lady from uh, the, the, the builder of the engine's daughter, and uh, a remarkable lady, Ellen Thompson. And uh, if you saw her dressed up in the pub at night, you wouldn't credit it was the same person who was shouting at you for using more than one swan vesta or lighting the engine fire. <clears throat> My uh, only stock in trade was I gave a, uh, a ride to John Snow, the general manager of the Bromley Hyde and Dimchurch Railway, um, and because he was hosting the engine there, offered a drive, he'd been on it before, and I would fire. Unfortunately, as he opened the regulator, my fire went out. Um, so I then had to try and relight it by throwing swan vessels at this vapour that was emerging, emerging from underneath the boiler. And uh, when it caught fire with a large pop, uh, I did notice afterwards he got a very red leg with no hair on it. He never said a thing. He carried on. I gave him great credit for that. Um, Anyway, great fun with the, 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 the Redwood engines. Um, here we can see David Clay behind the Sinolda having a good trip out. The other engines that burnt oil were, sorry, the other engine that burnt oil was Thunder from the Muir Valley, the engine um, with a, a, a bale of bridle type lookalike outline, but at that point, oil burning inside and it was, um, <coughs> Fascinating machine, but it earned its name Thunderer. They, they made an oil burner very, very effective at using industrial burners. And it created such a row. You had to sit with air defenders on in the cab, um, preferably air defenders on within sight of it. Um, but again, a remarkable machine. It was devised in those days to ensure that they weren't setting fire to the fields, the cornfields, alongside their line. 
Um, just to bring the story round a bit, uh, one of the more remarkable things that the society got involved with was a group of volunteers taking engines to Dresden in Germany. Um, they set up a scheme to take them to the Park Eisenbahn in Dresden, a, a fairly substantial 15 inch gauge line running around their central park. River Mike went and because of its nature it could go all the way around the track. River Northern Rock went but because it's back trailing wheels were somewhat more rip constrained. It could only go around part of the track. Uh, so it was very complicated operations for a two day weekend with their own locomotives, which were the Krauss type. Um, I'm just taking pictures of these things and talking to people, uh, not in German either, steam locomotive. Um, but I got invited onto the engine, got given at one point a shovel and because they were using coke or a coke type fuel i was just taken back to how we used to fill the firebox up on the river esque and the uh, in the golden old days and uh, they were they were quite tickled that somebody from a completely foreign railway should just drop into doing what they did just like that in fact it was an eye-opener because i ended up spending the afternoon on the engine driving it round. delightful people I mean, we didn't have any language in common other than steam loco, but uh, with a variety of drivers, a great time was had by all. And um, but for me, these were machines that could be interesting. They were pulling long trains. They were handling them at reasonable speeds. They were pulling them up moderate gradients. Uh, there wasn't any issues of bits flying out of the chimney. They steam like witches all day. They, they, these these were quite fascinating machines, and <clears throat> we sort of ended up in the spot where, oh, where is the one? However, before that, we ended up in dire straits of our own because our boilers were giving problems again. We ended up with boilers from uh, a company that had supplied us for years, and the river might first gave trouble. And then it was decided to buy two new boilers for Earth and Rock, just to make sure that we didn't get into trouble. And very sadly, something had happened in the supply chain for the material they'd acquired. And only after a few years did these boilers get condemned by the boiler inspectors because of the mix of materials in them. They had to be rebuilt. Luckily, we had borrowed an engine for the Easter when these boilers were away and it came. We'd had it from the Bure Valley Railway for Thomas events. Uh, we were planning a Thomas event. It came in a snowstorm. The volunteers had to dig out the track when the snow stopped storming. And we got the engine out to run shortly after this event, the great problem of workshop fire at Easter uh, 2013. Thankfully, the Bure engine worked a treat. We didn't expect to get what we got out of it. And they were very supportive in allowing it to run for here for two seasons. Um, a very different engine to drive. And you might not have built one like that, but it worked a treat and looked obviously dramatically different with its side tanks. <coughs> Hang on. Yes. Meanwhile, our own engines needed more than just cosmetic repairs. And here's River Might in the workshop in Workington being overhauled. And our friends at the Romney Hyde and Dimchurch sent up various engines, a 2 8 coupled, and eventually some of the bigger six coupled engines as well. Um, we won't hang about here, but even though you had to couple and couple at either end of the line, it soon became a thing that everybody took pride in doing swiftly and without issues. Now there was a thought the railway could do with another engine. And I'll just spend a couple more minutes leading to where we got because alongside the new engine project came the opportunity to acquire something from Spain. One of the old Krauss engines that had been cannibalized had given its wheels to this sadly monstrosity, which was a dieselized engine, which had run round a pump there in Madrid for 30 or 40 years. 
and the Spanish group had hoped to run a railway on the seafront just north of Mataro, just north of Barcelona, and had spent time rebuilding one in traditional form and another machine in a more anglicised appearance because they wanted another one that looked different. Eventually finance just overcame them and obviously, as you know, we acquired the bits and there's the team that got involved in bringing it over, the machines chassis taken round and to give credit to the guys who really saved the project and made it work, Alex Sharphouse and Jack Dibner coming to see the engine on its trials in the early part of a couple of years ago. It had to be tested with all combinations of everything it could be capable of doing, running with our own engines, running solo, running backwards, not quite running upside down, but if we'd had to, we'd have tried it. And meanwhile, sneaking along in the background was work on our own River Esk engine, which had been involved in the fire. In the basic engine was survived, but a lot of the components had been stripped off and were damaged in the fire and required replacement. The gentleman in the previous picture, Nigel Day, his speciality was improving locomotive activities by improving the front end, as they call it, improving how efficiently the steam moves out of the cylinders, not just goes in, but out, so the lack of resistance and how it goes up the chimney. So with the minimum restriction, you get the maximum draw. And so River Esk is back in Peter Hensman there, complimenting Nigel on all his efforts and the engine running very sweetly, very popular, um, nearly impossible to get a day out of. Just to wind things up, well, we won't prolong things now, uh, the little engines, they deserve a whole talk of their own because the work that's gone into restoring little Sinolda is quite remarkable. And it still does what those engines were doing 80, 100 years ago. And the other remarkable thing is reinventing uh, Katie and actually proving that when Katie was here in 1914, 15, 16, or whatever, it was possibly worn out, misunderstood, mis and the machine that we've got now is quite a dramatic improvement uh, and hails back to what Katie had been doing for the previous 20 years on the railway that had been built for Eaton in Cheshire. Right, we've just come back to see River, not River, right? Bonnie Dundee revived after many years and many years out of use and sent for its trials and purchased, sorry, not purchased, the rebuild funded by John Kerr of the Cleethorpes Coast. So she's running now at Cleethorpes, but she'll come back every year and we'll enjoy her. What else is there to enjoy out of the next 60 years? Well, this I think was going to be interesting. The new, revived, rebuilt Romney High and Dimchurch Black Prince is at Bouth, and I would hope would come here for trials. It's got a new superheated boiler, and we'll see what it does when it comes to join the rest of the engines. Uh, probably rubbish it on a little too much, but that brings this story, not to a close, but to um, a point in time. That's okay, yes. What do I need to do now? Very well, in the comments, <laughs> um, <laughs> on, Matthew Pye, who's clearly biased, has said River looked better in the um, intermediate phase from scale to narrow gauge when it had the old boiler. Um, clearly he's been buying lots of pictures in antique shops. <laughs> and well, then, the, the dome, I think, looked nicer. Yes. Because it, it, that's the dome that ended up on Katie, suitably modified. So the Katie dome has got a hell of a tradition, just slightly separated. Yes. And then um, Mike over in Wisconsin <laughs> has said, the Riverside in Great Northern followed our approach with the air braking um, and used commercial haulier type equipment as well. 
Um, so the, the precedent is all over the world. Ah. And I'm just seeing if anyone has said anything else. Um, Matt Ellis of Beamish and Fasinio Faye. So he hadn't realised the connection between the gas producer with River Esk and Linda. Oh, <laughs> well, I, I could tell you a quick story, seeing as you know and you're interested. We were running around with River Esk, not getting anywhere, to be quite candid. I got told off by the chief engineer for phoning up the professor and saying, is this engine all right? Can you not doing what I think it was built to do? And he said, well, you're supposed to experiment with it. Oh, right, that's all right. We know we can fiddle with it. That's great. We thought it was like done and dusted. Anyway, the Pestinioc tour turned up. There was Terry Turner and his good lady and um, Phil Girdleson. And Phil said, it needs some, how about some steam on this? So we got a bit of rubber pipe and we created the gas poker. Um, which was a bit of bent pipe with some holes in, and we connected the two into the, and the effect was, wow, yeah, this is what it needs. You've got to have steam. We were thinking the original engine had holes in the side of the fire to let air in, but it's the addition of that right amount of steam. But we were slightly ahead of Linda, so they were still doing it, and they, um, uh, how can I put it? Um, they weren't actually getting consistent results out of it. I don't think they got up the line. But when I got on the engine, having been invited on a trial, um, they got uh, thermocouples and a readout in the cab. And when you watched it, you could tell when it needed feeding more coal. What they were thinking it should be doing was feed the fire up, stop go to the next station, feed the fire. And when it lost the volatiles out of the fire, it stopped steaming. And when we started to fire it according to the thermocouple, you could keep the needle on the line. Smoke box temperatures at 430 centigrade, engine steaming like the proverbial. I'd never seen an oil fired engine steam like that on eight and nine cars. And uh, we had a great weekend, but um, maybe I shouldn't say when Phil shook the fire in between trains at Boston Lodge, he put the hot fire on the wrong bit. Um, when he pulled the lever, <laughs> strangely enough, it was the red bits that disappeared out of the hole. <laughs> and we had a train in about 25 minutes. And there wasn't anything much combustible left in Boston Lodge when we finished. <laughs> anyway, yeah, uh, it, mate. The, um, that probably leads in. Tre Trevor's commented, there's probably lots of stories we can't tell in a public domain. <laughs> and then we've had... I uh, hope he likes his... I hope he likes... I found his images. Yes. I hope he likes that. <laughs> and uh, Peter Fairholm has asked, when you use the reverser in the gear, do you have steam slightly on or do you have shut off completely? What we have is steam through the drain cock. There's enough leakage through the drain cocks. So there is some steam in there. I know that people would suggest you can get vacuum forming in the cylinders uh, and potentially stuff in theory, is drawn down the blast pipe. That was one of the big potential no-nos of running in reverse. And I think the high temperatures and lubrication have got more problems there. But in our case, it, how can I put it? I would commend it for piston valve engines on the basis that the valves don't go half the distance that they would do if you just leave them in a running position and it does reduce the wear and tear on the piston bell rings um, 
I mean, one of the things when we used to be able to run our own engine in inverted commas, you were able to try things for a number of months, years, and actually see what the result was. You might not tell anybody in case you've got it wrong. <laughs> but no, I mean, it, you, 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 were, you were trying to get things so that you moderated the damage. And, and with, for argument's sake, ring life, uh, you, could, you could keep an engine's uh, you know, better operational for much longer. Um, I mean, and we have. You know, what I'm trying to hint all around here is that there are so many things that nearly scuppered running or made the engineer's life more onerous. And now, if we look after the water treatment, if we handle them in certain ways, if we get the fuel from reasonable sources, then... Yeah. Um, one way and another, it's a lot less. Uh, um, it's it's like having an extra man in the workshop or an extra engine in the shed because we've not broken them um, or damaged them. And and the duration between what needs to happen to them is just dramatically altered. And the um, Mike Mike's mentioned that the breaking of in Wisconsin was in the 1960s. But we, we should probably say that most air brake 15 inch gauge railways in Britain now buy most of their air braking equipment from the States <laughs> on eBay because it's cheaper. <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, Big Bob's truck stop in Alabama is very handy um, <laughs> at supplying things. Yeah. Um, David Andrew Collins, um, has asked why was um, so Arthur Haywood did it become Northern Rock? <laughs> um, the Northern Rock Building Society, and that goes back previous to the Great Financial Crisis. The Northern Rock Building Society sponsored the locos with a certain amount of support should we say it wasn't just straight cash in hand there was a lot of publicity um how much disproportionate i wouldn't like to comment all i could comment is that the great financial crisis of just over a decade ago was when the northern rock was actually out of service for a little time being overhauled so there were wonderful cartoons in the papers about northern rock problems that could be suitably altered <laughs> to hang in the engine shed lobby, as they say. <laughs> and, um, Matt Berry, um, it is a Lempor blast by Pond River Esk now, isn't it? It is. It did have a kill chap at one point in the 1980s, um, which was a simpler alteration, but, but uh, Nigel Day's equipment um, includes, a, uh, I call it a device, but it's, but it's a, a non-mechanical device. It's a set of ducting bits inside where the pipes join together called a, I've forgotten the head now, a Cordina. And basically the steam escaping from one cylinder or one end of one cylinder of the chimney reduces the back pressure for the other cylinder. And we were given a demonstration with this with the, want of a better word, the static item before it got bolted in. And it was an, an eye opener to see it. And certainly the end result is that the locomotive does run remarkably freely. The only thing we haven't quite got round to is doing some proper testing. We were upset by um, COVID last year. I've got a big dipstick. Um, the next, if I get opportunity, will be to try and see what the net benefit of it is. Because there will be one. It'll be a saving in fuel. You know, we know it doesn't use a great deal compared to. And 
The interesting thing will be River Mike comes out. Now, River Mike always used to be a sweet running engine and it's got new rings. And when it's running, you know, a few more trips, it'll be as good as it can be. And that will be a remarkable comparison with, say, River Esk having done three seasons. Um, and the opportunity may be that, you know, I'd like to think another engine, perhaps the um, uh, Northern Rock could gain from being altered. I mean, you know, it depends who can say what at different times, but if you're only saving a small amount, but you're doing it every day, those days add up. And uh, it's a bit difficult to quantify unless you actually believe it's happening because we buy coal in big heaps. And, but at the end of the day, if you could save thousands of pounds, you wouldn't burn a thousand pounds of money in a pit in the garden, would you? Um, and, and, you know, the, the, the sum per day may not be great, but the sum cumulatively per season adds up. And fuel brings us on. Um, Matthew has mentioned um, something we were talking about the other day um, about the biofuel that gondolas using and what we may have to burn in the future with the coal crisis looming or in the middle of the coal crisis. <laughs> well, it's interesting. Our, our mutual friend Dickon from uh, the Throwcode Railway actually did his, um, his own university thesis on modifications to his locomotive there, Sir Tom, uh, with a, a pinhole grate or, um, and burning different fuels, including um, these wood composite block things. Um, I mean, they got a sea pill and it proved it was possible without burning the passengers to death. Um, so there's obviously some scope, although I think gondola does work remarkably gently for um, its, what should we say, the size of the machinery and what the steaming on the lake involves there. Um, I mean, the interesting one would be this um, torrified fuel, which is more dense. Um, it, it's modified. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know what you would call it? Compressed charcoal, I believe, is the nearest comparison. But they were doing some experiments on a zoo railway. In, is it Chicago? I can't remember just at the top of my head. It's 15 Milwaukee. inch, Milwaukee, that's right. And, you know, this, if, if somebody commercially is making something like that, it'll be there to buy. Uh, I mean, our great stocking trade at the moment is uh, remarkably since, uh, well, about 2000, we've burnt uh, an anthracite coal uh, very, very successfully. Um, because of the size of the beds that this coal comes out of in various countries, the consistency of it is just bizarre. When you're used to what were you were used to, you know, different coal mines sending out different stuff more or less every week. Um, and we got our coal from really the outskirts of Mongolia in China. We got some from the Red River for several years, which is in Vietnam, and we're latterly getting ours from, well, it's actually on a big heap on the dock in County Durham, but it came from Germany. Sadly, the mine shut, I say sadly, sadly for us, because apparently there was still an enormous amount of coal that would see all of us out uh, underground. Uh, we're in a different climate of who produces it, whether it's good and bad or indifferent for the world and uh, what will be available. I think from the Ravenglass point of view, there'll probably be a, a small supply of, um, I say a household fuel, but there may not be. And this is the advantage of being able to say, well, we can tinker and have a play and see what might work. And, um, you know, it might be a sponge of chip pan oil um, and some form of oil burning, maybe 
an option. But the coming downhill with oil is the problem uh, because you can't quite shut the burners down. I mean, Nigel on his Snowden epics, Nigel Day when he worked at Snowden and had oil burning down to it by an art. Uh, I mean, they, they switched it off at the top and came down the hill and then lit the burner right down the bottom. And our particular line, you know, we, could, we, we couldn't be doing something like that. Um, and it, it does involve a certain amount of tinkering, uh, physical tinkering. Uh, but, you know, the job's there uh, to be challenged. And I mean, the interesting thing is that we've got people who are driving who actually would be quite entertained by it. You know, previous years, the generations of drivers might go, well, we can't be hassled with that. Um, but I think our current crew, um, Give them a challenge, and uh, I think they'd quite take it. It'll make it more colourful. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, so that's all the questions. Um, I'm sure you'll all agree and thank Peter for the last two talks. Um, we are going to carry on doing the archive talks. Um, we have a, a catalogue planned, which features the three foot gauge era. Um, there's various others. I have been given a list and I've put it somewhere safe and I can't remember where it is. <laughs> but, but one of them does involve um, Lord Wakefield's attempts at landing and taking off from aircraft carriers as well. So there'll be a, a few different things over the, the next few months. And we may be doing them live from the museum archive as well. So we'll keep you posted. Thank you all for watching tonight and uh, we'll see you all again soon. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Stuart. Good night. Thank Good you. Night all. Thank you all.